And let's look at those things that Jesus said. As we look at the, the perception of the Lord, he said, number one, you are neither cold nor hot. If they were totally cold, what will that mean? Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 11, verse 11 and verse 12, to be cold, what does that mean? It tells us here, and many prof false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So when Jesus said cold, what did he mean? You know, sometimes when we are talking, you say, why well, you are cold to me. In our relationship, a relationship is cold. It's like there's a cold war between us. You're not talking to me. And I know it. And I feel it. There's, there's coldness in our relationship. That's what Jesus meant. When he said hot, neither cold, cold in relationship, cold in love, cold in, uh, cold in fellowship, cold loss of sin, total apathy. You're neither that. You say come to church. You say carry the Bible. You say wear the label. You say write the writing. You say sing the songs. You're neither cold nor hot. What did he mean when he said hot? He means zealous. You're not zealous. Fervent. You're not fervent. You don't have the burning zeal and the ardent love for me. I can't see that. I look, at, I look at John chapter 5 verse 35. Talking about being hot. Burning. In John chapter 5 verse 35. He, talking about John the Baptist, was a burning and shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Burning, shining light. And look at this in Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Hot, zealous, fervent, ardent, passionate. In Acts chapter 18 verse 25. This man, talking about Apollos, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And that's what Jesus meant by being hot. He said, on the one hand, you Laodiceans, you're neither cold nor hot. Those who are totally cold, they don't have any interest. They don't show any interest. And they don't even come near at all. They don't repeat anything. They don't read any part of the Bible. They don't uh, mutter any prayer unto me. But you are not like that. You are not totally cold. But on the other hand, you are not totally hot. And he said, I prefer that you are either cold or hot. Why would Jesus prefer that you are cold? Because when you are totally cold, when you don't have any interest, when you don't come to church, when you don't profess that you know Jesus, when you don't profess you are a friend of Jesus, it's easier to reach you. Look at Saul of Tarsus. He was cold to the Lord. He was opposed to the Lord. He was fervent for the devil. It was easy to reach him. Look at Judas Iscariot. Neither cold nor hot. He will follow after Jesus Christ. He saw all the miracles. He ate, you know, the bread that was multiplied. He said, I am part of them too. But was not totally inside. He was neither cold. He was not an open, opposed enemy, adversary. But was not a friend. He was not fervent. And was not passionate. He was not totally given and sold, committed, consecrated unto the Lord. It was very difficult to reach Judas Iscariot. Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And Judas Iscariot said, is it I? And Jesus said, thou hast said. But he couldn't reach that man. A person that is in between. It's very difficult to reach. He is hypocritical. He will not accept. He is insincere. He will not accept. He loves money more than God. He will not accept. Preach all the messages you want to preach in every convention, in every retreat, in every camp meeting, or in every Sunday worship, or in every Bible study. He will not accept that anything is wrong. I'm all right. I am rich. I increase with goods. And I have need of nothing. You can preach to other people. The people that are neither cold nor hot, they are in the middle. They are very, very difficult to reach. That's why Jesus said, I'll prefer. If you are totally cold, it will be easy to preach to you. 
If you are totally cold and opposed and you are not interested in the things of God, then I can talk to you. I can reach you. Look at some of our people who are here. And they've been here for many, many years. And now when you talk about their prayer lives, neither cold nor hot. You talk about their evangelism, neither cold nor hot. You talk about humility, saying, I am sorry whenever they are wrong. No, never. Neither cold nor hot. They know all the arguments. They know all the verses. They know all the scriptures. They know all the doctrines. And they have a lot of cassettes at home. They have a lot of books at home. They know all the songs. They can sing all the songs. They know all the preachers. Very difficult to reach people. Because they're neither cold nor hot. That's what Jesus said. Why don't you move either to this side and tonight become hot and become fervent and become fully yielded and become consecrated, surrender to the Lord. Then I'll be happy, he said. Now Jesus said, all I can say about you is that you are lukewarm. And with all your profession of saying that you have need of nothing, can I tell you your condition? And he began to tell them their conditions. Number one, he said, you are wretched. What does that mean? When he said, you are wretched in Romans chapter 7. I'm looking at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's what Jesus was saying about them. That actually their spiritual condition made them wretched in the sight of the Lord. When it says wretched, I want you to see, go back to verse 15. For that which I do, Allah, what which I do, I allow not. For what I would, I do not. But what I hate that I do, wretched man that I am. If I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that the law is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, wretched man that I am. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good sin, for to will is present with me. I know how to take decision. I know how to, I will say, I make up my mind. I will never do that again. But the grace to do it I don't have, O wretched man that I am. It said then, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, uh, that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. O oh, wretched man, that I am. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, Laodiceans, have you not checked up your lie? That the good, good things that Paul the Apostle taught you, that the good, good things were written in those epistles that were sent to you, you cannot do them. And you're living in sin, and it is like you are compelled to live in those sinful lives. Wretched people that you are. Then he said, apart from being wretched, number two, they were miserable. What does that mean when he said they were miserable? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. In First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, if in this world only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most miserable. We're rich. We're increasing in goods. We have need of nothing. Ah, since I came to church, the Lord has provided a job for me. Now that's all the testimony. Uh, now I bought a piece of land now. That's all the testimony. And I'm planning to build a house now. That's all the testimony. And look at me. When I came to this place, I didn't have a bicycle. Now I have a motor vehicle. That's all the testimony. If in this world only, all we can say is that I'm rich. I've got a job. And things are going on well for me. And we do not have the hope of heaven. We do not have the hope of seeing the Lord when he comes. We are not going to make the rapture because all we have is the riches and the goods and the wealth and the material things. We are of most men, the most miserable of all men. That's why Jesus said, you do not know. If all that you have is physical, material, material things. The real thing that gets you to heaven, you do not have, you are number one wretched number two you're miserable number three he said they were poor what, what did it mean when they were poor he said your money cannot buy your salvation all that your money can buy when you die and you are buried all those things are forgotten the real treasure the real salvation the real thing the priceless thing that gets you to heaven your money cannot buy you cannot buy the peace of mind the salvation of god and relationship with god and fellowship with god aren't you poor then when you cannot buy redemption all that you have god that you are rejoicing about will it get you to heaven how poor you are in psalm 49 
Psalm 49. I'm reading to you from verse 6. They that trust in their wells and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. You are poor. You don't have that which will buy salvation or redemption. And aren't you blind? Aren't you blind? Uh, do you see God? Because blessed are the pure in heart. They shall shall see God. With all your money, are you seeing God? Are you seeing the grace of God? Are you seeing the love of God? Have you seen the salvation of the Lord? Have you seen the mighty hand of God reaching down to your soul and doing something that money cannot do? When you look at the condition of your soul, wouldn't you say you are blind? In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, I'm reading there to you in verse 11. First John Chapter 2, verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. How many of us here would say, well, I, I thank God for my life. I thank God for my Christian faith. I thank God for my Christian profession. I thank God since I came to this church, I know the Bible. Since I came to this church, things are very different. In fact, even if there were no retreats and no Bible studies and no Sunday worship and no preaching from anybody, what I know now, I know, I know enough. I'm increased with groups. Everything is okay for me. And there's hatred in your heart. And there's malice in your heart. And you do not know that you are blind. And the darkness of hatred has blinded your eyes. That's what Jesus was talking to them about. In 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Reading in verse 9. He that lacketh these things is blind. What things? It's talking about that from verse 5. When it says you, you have faith, you have virtue, you have knowledge, you have temperance, you have patience, you have godliness, and you have brotherly kindness, you have charity. It says, he that lacketh all those things is blind and cannot see afar off. And he has forgotten that was purged from his old sins. That's what he meant when he said they were blind. And then he said they were naked. You know why he said they were naked? The clothes, the, the clothes of the garment of salvation they didn't have. And the thing that will cover their soul, close their soul, so that their shame will not be seen. That is the, the shame of their sin. The shame of original depravity in them will not be known. The clothes that will close them, the garment of righteousness or the robe of righteousness, they didn't have. And that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. That they didn't have. Righteousness, salvation, they didn't have. They were naked. Their souls were naked. And yet they were saying, everything is all right. Everything is all right. Uh, you came to this church. And you just join the church, you remove jewelry, and then you began to tie scarf, and you think that's salvation. And there was no repentance. There was no change of life. There was no transformation. There was no assurance in your heart. You cannot point to the day and the time and the place where you confessed all your sins and God forgave you and things became totally different. That now if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. And you're just moving with the crowd and just following the people. You'll be surprised when the trumpet shall sound. You will not have the garment of salvation or the robe of righteousness to cover your soul. And you'll be naked in the sight of the Lord. And then you'll go to a lost eternity. Come back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 15. It says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because, because you are saying, thou sayest I'm rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Uh, here, if you, as you look at the scriptures, you'll see that uh, when we're like this, we're neither here nor there. It's not a situation that pleases the Lord. If you look at Hosea chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 2. 
In Hosea chapter 10, verse 2, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When your heart is divided, you are not fully for God. You are not totally for God. You are not sold out to God. You are not completely consecrated unto God. You are neither here nor there. You are not an enemy. You are not a friend. You are not an opposer. You are not an adversary. But you are not a disciple. And you are not in the center of the will of God. You are just at the periphery. What he's saying is that your heart is divided. And you are found guilty and faulty in the sight of God. In Osea chapter 7. Osea chapter seven reading from verses eight and nine Ephraim has mixed himself among the people Ephraim is a cake not turned although you come here for fellowship and worship and bible study you mix with all these other charismatics and tongue speaking people prosperity people and nominal christians and careless christians and blaspheming Christians and the people that do not stand on the word of God. You are a friend to everybody. A friend to the people that don't believe holiness. You are a friend to the people that believe in holiness. You are a friend to the people that do not practice restitution. You are a friend to the people that say they believe restitution. You are a friend to everybody. You have mixed yourself with the people. A cake not turned. Strangers have devoured a strength. And he knoweth it not. Yea, gray ears are here and there upon him. Yet he knoweth it not. The sign of the old nature is upon him. He doesn't care. He doesn't worry. He doesn't think about it. What a terrible condition. And in such a terrible condition, the Lord is saying, He is not happy with such a condition. Being lukewarm, let's, let's know where you are. Let, let the Lord know where you are standing. If you want to really stand and stand and give yourself fully unto the Lord in Numbers chapter 32, verse 11. Numbers 32, verse 11. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. They have not fully followed me. They have not wholeheartedly followed me. They have not passionately followed me. They have been here and there, so-so Christians, so-so believers, so-so followers. They are not opposed. They are not in the forefront. They are not zealous. They are not totally dead. They are not in Egypt. They are not in Canaan. They die in the wilderness. All those people that left the land of Egypt... They will not be able to inherit the land because they have not wholeheartedly followed the Lord. What the Lord is expecting is that with all your heart and with all your soul, you'll follow the Lord. There will be no half an hour. There will be no, well, I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best. I cannot, well, in the world in which we live now, money is everything. If you don't have money, you don't have a job, you don't have education, you don't do this and do that, how are you going to make it in this world in which you are living? I'll be coming to church, but don't bother me. I, I can't go as far as you are talking about. Not everybody is going to be, you know, saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and passionate and on fire for the Lord. I cannot be like that. If you cannot be like that, you cannot get to the land of Canaan. You will not get to heaven. Because it says, because you are lukewarm and you are neither cold nor hot, you will not make it. The people that will get to heaven are the people that have abandoned everything. Because when you lay your hands on the plow and you look back, you will not get to the kingdom of God. It's a serious matter. A backslider that is just managing, just patching up, will not make it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. In Proverbs 14, 14, here it tells us the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And he will be full of self-praise. Self-congratulation. I'm all right. Things are going well for me. The backslider in heart. Filled with his own ways. But he says, a good man shall be satisfied from himself. He'll withdraw from self-praise. From himself. And that's what the Lord is telling us. And you see what the Lord said there. That because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said. Don't mind those people that say, once you are saved, you are forever saved. Once you are a child of God, you are forever a child of God. Nothing like that. Because you are neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. It says in John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 6 tells us, if, him not, if a man abide not in me, when you're abiding in Christ, salvation will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, holiness will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, obedience will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, faithfulness will be there. When you're abiding in Christ, the life of Christ will be visible. We can see it. But when those things are not there, you are not abiding in the Lord. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are burnt. It tells us, uh, you, you know, there are, there are people that feel that once your name is in the book of life, it's there forever. But Jesus is saying no, because you are neither cold nor hot. And remember, these were people that Paul the Apostle referred to as brethren. In Colossians, where I read to you at first. But they came to the situation where the Lord said, no, they were not measuring up now. I'm going to spill them out of my mouth. There's only one remedy. They must repent. Because he's standing at the door and he's knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him, fellowship with him. Look at Exodus chapter 33, chapter 32. Exodus 32, verse 33. Mark this in your Bible. Mark it for yourself. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever, whosoever, you know, there are times that some believers, they get to the point where they feel, because of who I am, they think that the honor we give them is the honor God is giving them. Well, they think that the respect that we give them because we're human beings and if we have known somebody for a long time and a fellow is active and a fellow is a churchman and the fellow is doing this and doing that, we always keep on saying brother, brother, sister, sister. Or sometimes to say yes, sir, to them. And because we're always saying yes, sir, yes, sir, to them, they don't count themselves as part of the whosoever. And therefore, they begin to live careless lives, disobedient lives, unholy lives, unrighteous lives. And they feel it doesn't matter because of who I am. Who are you? Because Paul the Apostle said, I put my body under. So that after I preach to other people, I myself will not be a cast away. Paul the Apostle knew that he was part of the whosoever. No matter how hot you have been, how fervent you have been, how zealous you have been, how passionate you have been, how prayerful you have been, how righteous and holy you have been, if you go back from the Lord, he will spew you out of his mouth. That's why it says here in verse 33, whosoever have sinned against me. Him will I blot out of my book. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying, Lord, this same church, you know something? You were there before. You knew the grace of God before, but now I'm going to spill you out of my mouth. Oh, they understood. They understood. Because he was talking in the language they really understood because Laodicea was not far from Colossae and from Herapolis. In the district of Herapolis, there was hot mineral springs. Water coming out of the spring will be transported to Laodicea over land in conduits, that is in pipes. But those pipes were on the ground, not buried underneath. And so the sun will be shining. By the time that water reached Laodicea, it was no longer hot, it was lukewarm. The same thing, cold water, was found in Colossae. And that cold water from Colossae will be piped to um, Laodicea. And by the time it got to Laodicea, again, it was lukewarm. Anybody that tried to drink, it will be soon nauseating. And when they try to drink, they will spill the water out. And Jesus said, exactly what I'm going to do to you if you keep on being lukewarm. Unfortunately, you know, for this church, for that Laodicean church, Christ had nothing. To commend in them, in their lukewarm, nauseating condition, they had lost everything worthy of praise. Their Christian profession was flabby, anemic. They were not on fire for Christ. They had compromised their Christian conviction and zeal, and they felt comfortable and complacent. 
they boasted that they were still rich and that they really and they were really poor in the sight of God. The city of Laodicea, would you know, was a banking, a wealthy banking center. And the spirit of marketing, the spirit of the marketplace, the spirit of, of the world had gone taking hold of the hearts of the people. They are proud and rich in store straw that is the straw that you use in building these huts they were rich in that that could be burnt up they were not rich in having the gold of faith and the gold of the christian life and the gold of righteousness and although christ threatened them that will vomit them out of his mouth he was still offering them an opportunity that if they will repent